Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the pre-race podcast. Unfortunately, not before a Grand Prix this weekend. Formula One's making us wait again. Gave us a couple of Grand Prix in a row. A very snoozy Azerbaijan. A fairly decent Miami. But then we've got the triple header coming up soon, Terence. It's going to be back-to-back-to-back racing. Are you looking forward to it? Excellent. I most definitely am. I most definitely am looking forward to it. Three races in a row, definitely. Something that... um. I think it's one of those things that I think divides a lot of people in a way. You know, I think if you spend a lot of time talking to anyone involved in F1, they tell you like the triple headers, they're a nightmare. Um, and ever since I started creating content, I can 100% see what they mean. But from a fan's perspective, it's great. And to be fair, one of those three races is Monaco. So it's really only two races when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Two races in a parade is what we've got over the next yes. three weekends, <laughs> especially considering, well, we're going to talk about the tyres later, but the tyres in Monaco, I'm very, very worried about. Let's talk first, though, about Nick De Vries. He's been the big talking point this week as just five races into the season. Uh, it looks like his Formula One career is basically over and done with. Like he's He's been bad, but has he been that bad where already he should be replaced? <laughs> I think it's been a case for Nick of um, he's done that. There are basically there's kind of two things that you can do wrong as an F1 driver. One is crash and mistakes and one off kind of like they happen in an instant problems. And the other is just generally being slow. Normally, if you're doing one of those things, you can kind of get away with it. Like if you're slow, but you're keeping it clean, then people can be like, okay, maybe they improve. If you're making, if you're crashing, but you're quick then, you know, people can kind of see improvement. People I look at that say, like, Yuki Tsunoda, he did crash quite a bit in his first year, but we could sort of see the potential there with his pace. Mm, Charles Leclerc. Whereas, yeah, Charles Leclerc, Verstappen even, yeah. in, when he joined, um, they would crash a lot, but you could really see the pace that was there. However, with Nick De Vries, he's just doing both of them at the moment, mm. where he's hitting walls, people, and when he's not busy hitting them, he's just not on par with anyone around him yeah i think that's the thing right he had had the first three races of the season was okay generally speaking australia obviously got taken out by logan Sargent. it was kind of just about making his way through i think it's been the last two races in particular azerbaijan was an absolute disaster class from start to finish like he hit the wall twice he hit yuki sonoda and then miami was basically the same like again when it came down to racing conditions clipped lando norris like he just hasn't been able to get any kind of grip on that car whatsoever in these last two races and especially because we had that kind of spring break where everyone was like, okay, you've got time to reset, really recalibrate this season. You've had a few races to understand the car. Now's where you get into it. Those two races being probably his worst two races really doesn't stand him in good stead. No, and we we even talked about early on, I think after literally two or three races, we sort of went, at what point do we sort of say that Nick De Vries isn't too great? Yeah. And I would say after five races we're pretty much there. Um, it's basically at the point where you've had enough different tracks, you've had enough different scenarios, you've had time to learn the car a little bit, obviously not a ton of time, but enough that you should be understanding the car and making some little bits of progress, especially for someone like Nick De Vries, who is a very interesting case as a rookie, non-rookie, whatever you kind of want to say he is coming into F1. So I think for him, he has reached that point now of, and I think one of the things that we've heard a lot of is it's like an ultimatum for him now. It's improve or that he's lost all the credibility that he had coming in. Yeah. And it's now solely those five races he's had improve or we're going to have to replace you. Well, I think you've nailed it there. I was going to try and get your opinion on that because he literally came in and said to everybody, I don't want to be classed as a rookie. Like, he's made all of these statements over the last few years. Like, even statements from 2019, where he was comparing himself to Lando Norris and Alex Albon, saying that he thought he was better than those two drivers at that point. Like, coming into Formula 1 now, everyone was talking about the fact he's Formula 2 champion, Formula E champion. Realistically, has he kind of put the pressure on himself because of some of those statements that he's made about, you know, the fact that he is 28 and he doesn't want to be considered alongside the rookies that are coming in and the rookies that we've had over the last few seasons. Yeah, I mean, he's not doing Formula E any favours, is he? Um, 
But yeah, it, it is an interesting one. And ultimately, I think you combine the fact that for anyone looking at it, you can see that it's not a inexperienced rookie. Um, and then combine that with him saying, I don't think I'm a rookie. I don't want to class myself as a rookie. To be honest, there was even like a lawsuit about whether or not he was a rookie or not. That's true, yeah. Um, so you combine all that together. Like if that, if that was someone, if that was, if that was Nico Hulkenberg in that car, mm-hmm. we'd all be saying like, nah, he, he can't, he's got to, he's got to go because he's just not good enough. Like you've tried him. It's not looking good. You should probably look for something or someone else to, to replace him. Yeah, that is the thing as well. And the, the problem he's also got is he's in that Red Bull system, which we know is just just so much talent comes through Red Bull. We look up and down the grid and even drivers you forget a part of the Red Bull or link to Red Bull. Like Carlos Sainz is one for me. I always forget that actually at one point he was in that Red Bull Academy. He was in that Red Bull Systems come through, been a really consistent driver. Vettel, Ricardo, Verstappen, like Kvyat. It just goes on and on and on the number of drivers that Red Bull have brought through. And they still have a lot of drivers available to them as well. Like the fact that he could be replaced at literally any point. They've got Daniel Ricciardo sitting in the wings at Red Bull. They've got Lawson. They've got Iwasa coming through. Like there's so many names that are already being linked to that Alpha Tauri seat. Is that another problem for Nick DeVries where because he's in a Red Bull, they can just point at a driver and be like, yep, you're next in the Alpha Tauri you go. See what you do for five races. And the other thing as well is he's not your typical Alpha Tauri driver in the sense that Red Bull will have put zero input into his junior career. They haven't invested anything in him. They've literally gone, who's available to see? in that seat okay we're not sure about our junior drivers yet okay we'll give him a go maybe he'll do well for the team but they haven't had any investment in him they don't have any you know look at yuki Tsunoda in his first year he didn't start off great but he was young they'd put money into him he was linked with honda you know he had all of this sort of like backing from red bull whereas de vries is a mercedes driver like yeah be honest (laughs) If they look at it and say, we've got a reason to stick one of our juniors in the car because he's not doing well. And from the team's perspective, they go, it's not going to get any worse performance wise. I can't see why they wouldn't. That's true. Do you think they would go for a rookie then? Because the the kind of debate going around and I think the fact that Daniel Ricciardo is in and around the Red Bull setup this year, like... Even at the beginning of the season, we were talking about will Daniel Ricciardo replace Sergio Perez at some point if Sergio Perez doesn't step up to the plate. Like Sergio Perez has won two Grand Prix now. I think that story is completely dead. But now it's will Daniel Ricciardo just, you know, do Red Bull a favor, go into the Alpha Tauri for a few races, maybe just sort them out, you know, get them a couple of points over the course of the season. And would you go for Daniel Ricciardo or would you be looking elsewhere at those juniors if you were in charge of Alpha Tauri? I think I'd be looking elsewhere at the juniors. And the reason is as follows. Coming into the year, there was a bit of talk about could Yuki Tsunoda really take on that role of the lead driver in the team? Um, and I think... At the start of this year, he's done well enough that you can say, yes, he's taken on the role of that lead driver. And you've got someone who's performing consistently well, driving consistently quick. So you don't necessarily need someone with that little bit more of experience. You can go with someone who's younger, who is a rookie. And I think that's probably what they would do. And also with Ricardo, I just don't think he'd want to go into mm-hmm. Alpha Tauri. Like maybe, you know, maybe he's looking at it and going, look, a seat's better than no seat. But... Can I see him going in? I don't know. And if they were to replace him with Ricardo, I don't think it's the worst thing from Avatari's perspective. You know, ultimately you're replacing a 28 year old with a 33 year old. Um, they're both in that middle age bracket, yeah. I would say, in terms of racing driver age. But I think they would probably lean towards a rookie or a younger driver. Yeah, I, I think so too, to be fair. I think Daniel Ricardo almost is put himself in a position where some of the talk that he's had over the course of the summer and last year when we knew he was leaving McLaren, when he was talking about the fact that he doesn't want to go towards a team that aren't capable of wins, aren't capable of offering him that opportunity of like possible championships within the next few years. 
I think he knows taking a seat Alpha Tauri doesn't really help him in any way whatsoever. Like, it's kind of extra effort for him. He's already been paid a lot by McLaren not to drive a McLaren car. And then on top of that, he can kind of have a year off. And I think he's been really enjoying his year off too. W would it be Lawson then for you? I think Lawson is the next up in that kind of regime right now for Red Bull. Obviously, he's disappeared away from Formula 2 this season but he's still in and around Formula One and still in and around the paddock fairly often. Would, would Lawson be your pick? If I understand correctly, I'm pretty sure he's a test driver for mm -hmm. one of the two. I'm not sure if it's Alpha Tauri or, or Red Bull, but I'm pretty sure he is one of the test drivers for them. Um, yeah, Lawson would be the pick for me. Ultimately, he's someone who's come through their system, is still young and has shown potential. I would say similar-ish potential to like a Yuki Tsunoda when he came through. So I wouldn't have a problem with them putting Lawson in, Lawson in the car. Yeah, me too, actually. I think Lawson has just kind of always been on periphery. He's always been like nearly there and it's always just not quite clicked for him in terms of where he's been at in terms of that like season or if he could have won Formula 2 at some point or even just been like top two in Formula 2 at some point, but he's never quite been able to get there. And that's maybe just cost him a little bit. If it comes all the way down to like 2024, I think the thing with Formula 1 at the moment, we don't see too much chopping and changing during the season, really. Like a lot of the time we see the teams at least settle. Like even Daniel Ricciardo last year, McLaren absolutely were trying to get rid of him didn't want him in the car and yet they still stuck with him until the end of the season i think nick de Vries might be in that kind of category as well where they stick with him till the end of the season at that point iwasa might have the super license points he's been doing fairly well over the course of the season in f2 so far if it's then lawson versus iwasa which way do you think red bull might go then that's i think that's just that's a tricky one um Ultimately, I think it will come down to where Iwasa finishes because mm -hmm. I don't think they'd be opposed to giving him another year in the seat. I don't think they would be too opposed to, in Formula 2, that is. Um, I do think there is an element of like Liam Lawson not being in Formula 2 and admittedly, like you know, he's done well in other series when he's raced in them, but there is a little bit sort of that Formula 2, Formula 1 route that is incredibly useful for drivers and i think ultimately it will come down to where iwasa finishes this year like if he's in like fifth or fourth place maybe not but if he's in like top two top three then i could see it being more likely yeah mm, i don't know i think just the way that he's come through he does remind like, i know it's a super easy comparison to make considering they're both japanese drivers and both coming through the red bull system but he's very much followed the same vein as yuki sonoda and yuki sonoda came through even though he didn't have the greatest of Formula 2 seasons that we've ever seen. He still came through into that Alpha Tauri seat and was kind of rushed into that Alpha Tauri seat a bit. Maybe that's the worry a little bit, where if Iwasa is also rushed into that Alpha Tauri seat in the same way, it's kind of taken Yuki Tsunoda a couple of years to actually get into Formula 1. He didn't really hit the ground running. Maybe Iwasa doesn't hit the ground running too. So yeah, maybe they stick him in Formula 2 for another year. They just kind of let that roll over once more. And then if he has a, another good year in Formula 2, then 2025 will be the opportunity for him to come in and maybe get into that seat. Again, we don't know where Sergio Perez is going to be at this point. We're assuming Max Verstappen is still going to be around at Red Bull, but he's always hinting at retiring as soon as he possibly can, especially if sprint races continue to happen. So a lot can change in the next couple of years at Red Bull and just in Formula One in general, to be fair. Yeah, for sure. I think Red Bull is probably one of the most unpredictable teams when it comes to their academy and like who's going to come up through their academy and who's going to stick and who's not there's a lot of times when we've seen people like they're clearly going to be you know, great um and then they sort of turn out to not be a lot of people we see who aren't great at red bull and then leave and then do amazingly well you know you look at probably gasly and science is just two of them um so i think there's a lot of people there's it's so hard to predict with with the Red Bull Juniors and but ultimately what the, the consistent thing I would say with them is that unless you come up as one of their like absolute superstars, very rarely 
do they tend to like stick with Red Bull? Stick mm. in Red Bull, if that makes That's sense. That's true, yeah. That thing I would that w- I would say is a consistent kind of theme, and I and I would probably, in the nicest way to Iwasa or Lawson, they both fit in that boat of decent drivers, but by no means like superstars. Yeah, they're not displacing Max Verstappen anytime soon as like the king of the Red Bull setup and being yeah. that like clear number one driver of not only Alpha Tauri but then also red bull and being that kind of number one that they are going to build championships around and that kind of thing talking to championships and kind of trying to build towards them i also wanted to get your thoughts on alpine as laurent rossi has come out and uh he is not happy considering alpine i thought personally we're having an all right season you know all right ocon didn't have a great first race alba uh, sorry gasly has hit the ground running and done fairly well like apart from australia where they obviously smashed into each other you'd say that they've had pretty good start to the season sitting in fifth place probably comfortably the fifth fastest car have occasionally been battling with the ferraris and mclarens on track but rossi came out just called it how it is and was like, they are not good enough right now. We were expecting more from this Alpine team. I feel like that's the case with Alpine, like every single year. They're always sort of like, we should do better. We need to be doing better. And it's like, are we doing better? No. Um, (laughs) And and I feel like there's something just fundamental about them. Like I can't quite put my finger on it. Because they do have resources, they have personnel, they've got a good driver lineup. They just, they seem very much a team who are content to like just lay blame to people very soon. Mm-hmm. They're they're happy to like blame team principals. They're happy to blame drivers. They're happy to blame like not CEOs, but like you know the people above team principal, like management or whoever. It 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 just feels like a team that it never it decides what it's like process is or it's like culture and path that it's taking but it never has the patience to stick with it long enough before they go this isn't working we're yeah. changing it <laughs> and it feels a bit like that again already like Cyril when Otmar came in and it already feels a little bit like they're going this hasn't worked okay it's like Chelsea with managers like yeah <laughs> they, they play 10 matches and they're like it's bad change next one comes in no change like it it feels a bit like that yeah it's too easy like as you said they've they've got the resources they've got the money behind them where it's like almost too easy for them to find somebody else like it's too easy for them to be like oh we can just change if we want to and like rossi was saying the same thing interesting that you brought up otmar because they were kind of back and forth and otmar came out like later on this week and was like um, actually, I think I've been doing all right. I think, like, from what we've got, I've been doing okay. And then, like, Rossi, like, smashed back and was like, no, no, you're responsible for performance. Like, I know you've got a team around you, but the buck stops with you. So already you can see there's a bit of back and forth between Otmar and Rossi, and maybe they're not the closest of friends when it comes to that Alpine setup. No, um, it it feels like classic Alpine. <laughs> so I'm say, like... <laughs> I'm not at all surprised. And I think it's a case of it doesn't help that they found themselves very much in this middle ground. I don't think it's the fact to do with they're not ahead of McLaren at the moment because they have been better than McLaren by far. If it wasn't for Australia, they'd easily be in fifth, yeah. well ahead. Um, I think it's just a case of they're looking at like an Aston Martin who are like behind them, slash occasionally on par with them last year, who are now miles ahead of them. Mm. Admittedly, Aston do have a particular aerodynamicists that they've nabbed to help them in their progress but i think for aston not aston alpine sorry you're looking at a team like them and going why isn't this us yeah why aren't we doing that because they were in very similar positions arguably alpine were in a better position last year oh well, yeah alpine finished fourth in the constructors and fairly comfortably as well like they were, we were battling at, back and forth with mclaren but they actually we were looking at fernando's yeah. move like yeah where is he going <laughs> Yeah, we genuinely, people are like, what on earth is Fernando Alonso doing here? Like, why is he moving across to Aston Martin? And everyone was like, oh, they're just paying him loads. That's all it is. Like, Fernando Alonso's just moving for the money. He can't see that Alpine are going to win. Surely he doesn't think Aston Martin are going to win either. It's got to be the money. But maybe Fernando Alonso did know, you know, El Plan finally clicking together. <laughs> 
he saw the line with Aston Martin and he's picked himself up four podium trophies. It is more than he got in the two years of Alpine. So he's probably very, very happy with that move. It's interesting that you mentioned that like behind the scenes though, Fernando Alonso. And for me, it's Daniel Ricciardo. Daniel Ricciardo had everything. Like literally they gave him the keys to the Renault slash Alpine like kingdom. And they were like, you are going to be the man. And he stuck around for like a year and a couple of months. And he was like, actually, I'm off to McLaren. (laughs) And that was it. Yeah. And it was like, he was driving well. Like when he, in that second year at Renault, like he took a little bit to get going, but that second year at Renault, he was doing well. And if in hindsight, if you ask Ricardo, he should have stuck with them a hundred percent. Like, I think he would have looked back and gone, the move away from Red Bull wasn't the worst thing the Renault but the move to McLaren really was his downfall but I think it's like you say he clearly got to Renault and just went just doesn't have the that feel of a Mm -hmm. place that's going places and I think as a fan watching the sport like you look at the teams and Alpine just doesn't have that feel they just don't seem like I can't quite put exactly my finger on it um they just don't have the feel of a team that are going to make progress and again, yeah. like when was the last time they were up when was it when alonso was winning championships arguably a bit when they were lotus and raikkonen was you know off on one for a year or two or whatever mm. but in general not since alonso championships have they kind of been up there it's a little bit I mean, mclaren not quite the same extent like they were sort of winning races here and there and doing generally all right but for alpine slash renault it's been a good 15 plus years really 15 years or so of them just always being like we should be better than this yeah and nobody ever seems happy at alpine like even when no. they do well even when something's going right they're always like yeah but we should be winning we should be winning championships like it seems very they never impatient. really yeah they never build on anything they never like get a brick in place and are just happy with that brick they're like, excellent, we've got that brick in place, <laughs> but where's the rest of the house? Like, <laughs> like you you just got to do it step by step, and it doesn't feel like they ever really have that. But maybe that is a culture thing. Like, a lot of the time we talk about, you know, Mercedes have this mindset where they have that culture, and it took them a little while to click into gear, but they stuck with that culture. Then they got in Lewis Hamilton, and it all kind of went from there. And, like... Ferrari, in that kind of negative sense, we always talk about Ferrari and how the fact that whenever they seem to come under pressure, they do seem to make mistakes. They do seem to buckle. Like, it seems to just be a thing that Ferrari can't seem to get off their chest. It's almost like Alpine have that, but Alpine's is like a a culture of they're not happy, but they're happy enough. Like, all of the team seem like we're doing the best that we can, but everybody above the team is like, no, you're not. <laughs> and they can't really seem to yeah, get a balance yeah. between it. It almost feels like the people at the team, like working within the team, understand that they are a midfield team and always feel like that's their limit. Whereas the people above the team are like, no, we're not a midfield team. Yeah. And everyone else is just like, yeah, yeah, but we are. Um, <laughs> like, we are. <laughs> What do you we, have, to do, we, d- we just we haven't got the performance like red bull are a second ahead of us in qualifying every single week like we can't find that kind of performance and i, I suppose yeah we we kind of said it at the start of this segment but aston martin and the fact that they've been able to do it is just salt in the wound to alpine right and like the renault system and the fact that this and team with alonso <laughs> Exactly, yeah, with Fernando Alonso that left the team for Aston Martin. Like, it's just a lot of things that are kind of culminated in the start of the season for Alpine being good from a fan's perspective, but not being where they want it to be and that not being the expectation of the team. The other thing I would say is as well is, obviously, neither of us have worked at Alpine, um, so we don't know personally, but it seems so clear that anyone that goes there like really quickly knows that it's not like, like you look at Ricardo, he was there for two seasons and went, then they brought in their next kind of building block, like, you know, big player Alonso a couple of seasons gone. And they're like, Oh, Piastri will bring you in and you'll be our guy now. And he's like, I'm already gone. 
Like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone can just tell that it's just not. It's just not going places. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing, right? It's. He, like yeah oscar piastro didn't think about either that was behind the scenes there obviously had his whole junior career with them was building his way up into the team but he was their test driver for a year was part of the formula one set up for a year and didn't want to be part of it anymore <laughs> in, in in fairness to oscar like at the time when he signed his mclaren deal the intention was. was that he would be at williams so i can understand that from the sense of like i'd rather race for mclaren than williams mm. which which makes sense um so there is a little bit there but it i still feel like he if he really believed in alpine he wouldn't have made that <laughs> switch and it just yeah. seems like that's the case like no one i feel like it's you know when you do anything like any sort of task and it and it's dependent on like how much effort you put in mm-hmm and it's very much a case of like you know when you know when you've really put in a hundred percent effort into something and i feel like at alpine it's the kind of thing where they're like yeah we're doing our best but like they know that it just isn't and it might not be them doing their best you know as in you know i'm sure that everyone at that team does give it their all but in just in terms of the way that it's structured they may feel like they're doing all that they can but deep down they kind of know that they're not and i can only sort yeah. of point to maybe something like that so the drivers come in and they're like oh, why aren't we doing this or why aren't we doing this and there's so many little bits and pieces where they're like nothing seems to be clicking yeah and like i can't see it working yeah but nothing I- seems to be quite perfect like everything's just a, that tiny bit off and obviously when that adds up over lots of little things you get that midfield it's- performance where they're not quite on the level yeah. of those top teams and it's like the difference is like you, uh, you mentioned Hamilton moving to Mercedes. His first couple of years at Mercedes, his first year or two, was it? Um, like it wasn't great. It wasn't I mean, like they were sort of like third ish, fourth ish fastest car, but could see where the team was going and could see that it was progressing. Whereas I feel like our people join Alpine who are probably a little bit behind where Mercedes were when Hamilton joined. But people just look at it and go, I can't really see where this is going. They're just sort of like, it's like they're rowing a boat with one oar and they're just like <laughs> rowing in circles. Yeah, that is, that is a good point, actually. I'll talk about saying rowing in circles. We'll move on to the, the final thing I want to cover with you, just like in this kind of little break that we've got from Formula One before we go back to back to back Grand Prix, which is the racing itself. It feels like Formula One is kind of going in circles with its idea of what racing should be and how racing should work because we've got tyre changes and that's not quite seemed to work. We've had the performance changes with porpoising, but now people are complaining that the cars are too close in qualifying but can't pass in the races. So it makes for kind of exciting qualifying, but not very exciting racing like we're almost at a crossroads where Formula One is like, okay, we, we've introduced this 2022 regulation change. We wanted the cars to be closer. We wanted the cars to be able to follow better. They can, but now they also can't overtake. And that's kind of the f- best bit of motorsport, right? Like the best bit of any race is where we have two cars going at it and one of them manages to just overtake the other because he's got the tiniest of edges and pulls off an insane move. Like, that is the highlight a lot of the time. And none of the cars quite seem to be able to do that. Like, even in Miami, we had 60-plus overtakes, and still people were coming away from it like, "Ah, but was the racing actually that good? Most of them were probably just Max Verstappen, really, you know. He's made, like, 10 or so there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a tricky one because I think what we're finding is, and we've always seen this in Formula One is the more time, the quicker you make your car, especially in the, the age of aerodynamics, the quicker you make your own car, the trickier it is for cars behind and everyone else to race. I don't think there's ever a scenario where the cars get quicker and it, makes it easier for cars around you to race and follow etc and i think that's just what we're seeing in the sense of like i think i'm pretty sure they mention it every single race they're like 
the qualifying time here last year was a 127.9 and they're banging in like 125 zeros or something and you're like yeah. they're like two and a half seconds quicker than last year already so what you're kind of seeing is that sort of progression of design in the sense of they're making cars better and they're optimizing their own design because none of the engineers or anyone cares if they're affecting the cars behind them all they care about is how do i make my car quick that's it the more time you give them with the regulations that's just kind of how it's going mm. and the other thing i would add into this and we can talk about this a little bit more is the thing that doesn't help this at all is the current state of the tires it just seems to be like we've had two races now where someone has done the entire race on hard tires pretty much yeah it does seem silly like, the tires are crazy <laughs> it just seems like the problem that they had at the beginning of the year, it seemed anyway, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, was sometimes they were like overheating and a lot of the drivers were worried about the degradation in terms of overheating the tyres. But they seem to have gotten over that. And as you say, now you can do an entire race on a hard set of tyres. Like we saw Alex Albon do that in Australia last year and we were like stunned. And nobody else did that for the rest of the season. It was a crazy tactic that worked once. Now everybody's trying it. Like if you if you qualify out of position, like Azerbaijan, we saw Nico Hulkenberg and Esteban Ocon do it. Like if you qualify out of position, you just roll the dice. You you go on the hard compound tires. You do the entire race on the hard compound tire, and you hope for a safety car somewhere. Like we we were discussing just before recording, we were saying one of the upcoming races is Monaco. Everyone from eleventh place downwards is one hundred percent going to stick on the hard tires. <laughs> And just go as long as they can and hope for a safety car a red flag that's it because everyone knows that you can just take these tires. I mean, we saw it with um sergeant in miami he came in on lap one off of yeah. his medium tires i think and put the hards on and went to the end yeah that's 56 yeah, laps think... in yeah admittedly he, he dropped off pace wise a little bit but still like it just shouldn't be like that i don't understand like no one's looking at it going you know saying oh why can't we make them like i don't know they need to look at it. i mean in general it's it is a tough job for pirelli to to get them right but i think it's one of those things at the moment that just doesn't help because what you end up with is everyone generally on the same tire strategy or similar and because there's not a huge difference it means that it's hard to get close and overtake enough as it is then you throw in a very small tire differential and it's nearly impossible it's kind of getting to the point where you need a much quicker car slash extremely fresher tires Like we were talking like you know new mediums versus old hards or max verstappen's red bull is what yeah. you needed to overtake people basically yeah it was absolutely crazy in miami wasn't it as like that final stint where people like verstappen hamilton was another one that swapped onto the mediums at the end and then because they had that huge tire differential they finally showed that you can overtake on these tires, but it needs to be like 40 lap old hard tires versus 10 lap old medium tires. Like the tire difference between those two things yeah. is absolutely massive. And like, we just can't expect that to happen every single race. Like if there had have been a safety car in Miami, everyone would have come in and pitted and then everyone would have been on the same tire. We wouldn't have probably seen that chaos or the, the overtaking that we saw at the end of Miami because everyone would have come in, pitted, had new tyres and there'd have been no opportunity for that overtaking. It's interesting that Pirelli have sort of seen this. And again, I'm a little bit confused. So they've come out this week and they've said that they are working on a new specification of slick tyre. Uh, we're going to see it in Silverstone. So it is coming very, very soon. And actually we're going to see it in Free Practice 1 and Free Practice 2 in Spain. But... They talked about it in their press conference as being a tyre that had a higher level of like sustainability and a lower degradation, which is the complete opposite of what we need right now. Yeah, it's basically what Pirelli... I mean, Pirelli's first and foremost concern always has to be like safety of the tyres. They yes. don't degrade so much to the point of like failure. Um, and basically what probably always say year after year is, you know, the cars get quicker and quicker every year. They put forces higher and higher through the tires. The tires need to be basically beefed up in order to take that. And that in turn brings more durable tires. And the, I think what, what you tend to find is the issues come from when 
they bulk up the tires because they're anticipating high performance, but they almost go too far. And I kind of feel like that's what's happened this year is they sort of bulked it up a bit. The cars have improved, but they've like assumed it's going to improve so much more than like doing they have, but we're ending up with just sort of always being like the same medium, hard, hard, medium. That's basically it. Nothing else. And like you say, with them saying their tires are coming in and they're going to be almost like more durable and less deg. It's a tricky one. Like I understand why they're saying that, but at the same time, having watched the last two races and in general this season, like I want to say Australia as well was just mm-hmm. a single. It was a single stop without yeah. all the red flag chaos and whatnot. It would have been. So yeah, it's it's a bit frustrating. I think is what it is. Obviously, neither of us are tire specialists or engineers, so it's very easy to sit here and be like, "Why can't you just make it better?" Um, but it is a little bit frustrating because it's one of those topics that we've had for so long now. Where yeah. We just say, why isn't this better? It's more just throwing in like any kind of variety. Because as you said, like it's always medium hard. I... It's always that way around usually. Like you start, if you're starting at the front of the grid and you're in the position you want to be, you start on the mediums because they're the better tire off the line. And then you go onto the hard compound tire and that's your race like we never really see anyone go on to soft tires unless it is a safety car and you've got six laps left to go and you chuck on a pair of soft tires because you've got six laps left to go and they're not going to degrade in that time or you're mclaren and you're mental and you chuck on the slick tires at the beginning (laughs) of the miami grand prix and then you finish 17th and 19th anyway and it was all a bit of a waste of time McLaren are turning into Haas with the strategy where they just do something and hope it works. Um, <laughs> and do you think it, one of the things that's been suggested often is the sort of mandatory you have to use each type of tyre? Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that would be something quite interesting and would be in one that's just quite interesting to just try and see how it works. Because teams do have the tyres available because they always have like a set of softs that like if there is a late safety car or whatever, they can strap on. Um, so I do think it would be interesting to at least see and whether or not that does add a little bit of, you know, um, as uh, oh, Chris Eubank Senior would say, add a little bit of spice to the <laughs> event. Um, it would be interesting to see, I think. So it's something like that, because I do think it's getting a little bit stale with the tyres. And you tie that in with it getting a bit trickier to race is not a good combination. You kind of want to avoid it if you can yeah that's the thing as well right like we kind of come full circle but the fact that because they got rid of the porpoising (laughs) wait wait (laughs) thank you (laughs) (laughs) for those who don't understand i've discovered the soundboard on discord (laughs) (laughs) i can't even remember what i was saying and because they've gotten rid of the porpoising they made the cars really stiff the dirty air problem has also come back so like that's on top of the fact that the cars then also aren't graining the tires as much they're just sitting in the dirty air the aerodynamics are getting back to where it's like trickier to follow because again we're getting more intricate front wings more intricate side pods and floors and the the more these cars develop the more intricate they get the worse they are at actually racing one another like they get quicker they're much faster but they're not good at the core thing which is racing like the actual overtaking changing positions with one another and not just trying to undercut or overcut which i think is like most of formula one right now is like okay i'm a team i don't really want to have to risk my car being side by side with another car so what we'll do is we'll plan to overcut them here or undercut them here and we'll get them on the tire strategy instead but it's almost like the issue you have there is you end up with like your tire strategy is basically allows you like one move yeah (laughs) someone you know it's like if you're battling someone you have one opportunity on your tire strategy to get past this one car otherwise that's it nothing yeah. else you can do <laughs> you know it is, and that's if you're on the same kind of similar strategy it's only when you're on a different strategy that it kind of makes a bit of a difference like we saw with like a hamilton uh in the race in miami 
So I, I do get what you mean, but it's a tricky one to solve. And there are a lot of quick things you could try and throw at it. You know, mm-hmm. you could do an Alpine and just try and fix it as quickly as possible and then just fail <laughs> miserably. Um, but ultimately, I think it's going to take a bit more a bit more thought than that as, as to what it really is. And they have to decide. And I think we need a little bit longer to determine if it is the cars or not. Like, as you say, we had 60 overtakes in Miami. That's not too bad. So, yeah, I think it'd take a little bit longer to determine really what's what's the kind of key cause and whether or not it needs to change. Because I think, I well, ultimately, the error is not going to change. You know, they made one change, the big change, the error rules, and then they made another one at the end of last year to get rid of porpoising. And they can't change the error X again. <laughs> you know, surely they can't. They can't no, do that. So not I now. Think not now that everybody to... has copied Red Bull, and we're going to see ten Red Bulls in Spain. Like if they changed it now, yeah. it just everyone else would be like, "Well, we, uh, we've done it now. We spent the whole the spring coming for, for Spain." Is it? Pretty much. Like, like there's a uh, sort of the plan for most teams. So like Mercedes and Ferrari, are obviously the ones that people are keeping most of an eye on. They're bringing some in Imola, aren't they? Yeah, it's like a, a little bit in Imola. A little bit in Monaco, and then like the full package as it will be until the summer right. break. So effectively, this, this, in Spain. this triple header to kind of round up this triple header is key. Yeah, because if we don't see them closing up the gap in this triple header, that's it. Yeah, we're basically yeah. well, we're waiting until at least the summer break to see like another possible like swap around in terms of like Mercedes radical redesign, as Toto Wolff has put it, and. Ferrari trying to turn some form of qualifying pace into race pace, which again was their problem last year, and they they haven't quite been able to move that across still. So it's still the the same problems that we had in 2022, really, and we're still waiting on either of those two teams, maybe Aston Martin, to close the gap to Red Bull. Like, just not even, not even to have a different championship or not even to have a championship battle i don't think this year just more to see somebody else on the top of the podium that is i think what it comes down to at the end of the day is races it doesn't matter how great the battle is the second place because it's always better if it's for first place yeah (laughs) yeah like that's the react that's the reality of it all um it's it's just a case of as long as there is something on the first place, that's always going to be seen as interesting and something that people enjoy to watch because there is that sense. Formula One is definitely a sport where it's like you get on a podium. It's like look at Lewis Hamilton; he gets second place or third place on the podium. It's like cool, yeah, whatever. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> it's not that really that, that really matters. Yeah, how often do we see in drivers' interviews? It's like you know you want to win. Your goal is to win. You know, unless you're Kimi Raikkonen, you know, it's more like a hobby for me. You know, but yeah. him. Otherwise, everyone wants to win. I think until we start to see, start to see people at least kind of challenging, like we kind of got there towards the end of last year, mm. I, I guess with like a different winner other than Red Bull or Ferrari. I mean, other than just Red Bull to be honest, most of the year. Um. So yeah, I think until we start to see that, and maybe it gets better because Red Bull are gonna have some penalties supposedly applied to them. Is it really going to make a difference? Probably not. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. I this mean, triple header is important, though. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Also, I like, feel like we shouldn't talk down on podiums, especially to Nico Hulkenberg. Bless him. He's been really trying over the last few years. <laughs> uh, there was an alternate universe where he got a podium in Australia. I don't know if he thought this at the time, yeah. but I remember watching it and going, hmm, after all the madness, Hulkenberg's in fourth. And Science could get a penalty here. <laughs> yeah. So what? Oh my gosh, it, it could happen. And then obviously it didn't. But there's yeah. an alternate universe where it did happen. I mean, there's, there's an there's alternate also universe like, where he's yeah. got like ten podiums. I was gonna to say <laughs> he's he's had a few <laughs> chances along the along the career. I don't want to don't want to completely throw him under the bus. But I was watching a couple of old races recently, and uh, it was Brazil, 2012, 2013, yeah. where he was leading the race in a Force India. Yeah. And, and then just went wide, uh, and then just yeah, Germany twenty nineteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's 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 thrown a few away. Bless him. Yeah. <laughs> he, anyway, he <laughs> on that note, hopefully we'll be back next week with a little bit more update on Imola. Like 
hopefully we'll see a little bit more from the teams in terms of upgrades. They've still been a little bit behind closed doors, like we've heard bits and pieces, but not full set and we haven't yet seen the new upgrades on the car. So we'll definitely be delving into those a little bit more and seeing if anybody can get close to Red Bull. And also the new qualifying format in Imola as well. There's another little change to those bits and pieces, but we'll delve into that when we get to Imola next week. Is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else. I think we've, I think we've pretty much nailed it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Can't think of it. It's a bit. It's a bit strange. It's one of those weeks where we get, you know, there's not been a huge amount going on. There's been a bit of driver talk and a bit of bits here and there. But next week it will be a race coming. <laughs> I like Imola. I like Imola, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think Imola always always throws in a little spanner in the works and maybe some rain. A little rain race. We'll see some and intermediate Leclerc tires. Not hit the barriers. <laughs> I don't know. He did hit the barriers in Imola last year. Just, uh, <laughs> just as just to we'll mention that um <laughs> but yeah definitely back for Imola and kind of with a little bit more on the upgrades and the teams moving into it thank you so so much for watching the last podcast did incredibly well post miami mm. the the algorithm just likes miami i think just the, the miami grand prix really enjoyed the algorithm and the algorithm enjoyed Miami. So thank you very much. If you're new to the channel, thank you very much for joining us. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you are new again, even though you're probably new from the last one, because again, the last one did, did, did well. Are we trying to Are we trying to beat... Can we beat the last one in this one? That's the, it's going to be a close game. He's easily the best one we've had, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the Sorry. best podcast. So it should, again, it should do better. Will it do better? Mm. <laughs> That's if there's one thing i've learned from being on youtube it's never to expect anything <laughs> <laughs> but you can expect us to be back for imola thank you so much again and we'll see you then